Welcome back, post game. Joining us, as always, is our great friend, colleague, and comrade, Ben Burgess. I was just thinking of uh, how we don't need to be attached to, you know, words or affects that might undermine our efforts. But I will say, because I'm on a, not as much as you are, Ben, but I have been on a little bit of a hitch kick. Yeah. <laughs> no one made like calling people comrades cooler sounding than he did. That's another one we're going to have to give him. <laughs> he was very, and it's so funny because I don't know how, but on the other hand, I don't know how it would register today now that there is like some of that sort of discourse coming back. Cause you, you really would, his whole brand, particularly in the Bush era was sort of like this kind of fake sexy radicalism. Mm-hmm. with like the neoconservatism. So I think there were probably some people who today as, as it comes back a little bit, they would be freaked out. But if it, but in the Hitchens era, they were just like, Ooh, comrades. <laughs> what an evening we have ahead of us, honey. <laughs> but at any rate, it sounded cool. Ben, my comrade, you ready for your song? Absolutely. Brother books. All right. <laughs> That's right. They get in the habit of actually breaking down these right wing arguments. Logic for the left. Logic Break it down. down. Break it down, Ben. And of course, it's bad faith. It's ridiculous. There's abundant evidence that uh, at this point uh, that that's bullshit. bullshit. And if you're actually like thinking about it and breaking it down, okay, that's also bullshit. Give them arguments. <laughs> when I've said this in the past, I've, I've got a lot of hate for this. Using a lot of logic. Logic for the left. One of the premises. Yes. For the sake of argument, we shouldn't be quick to accept that either. For every dollar increase in the minimum wage, there are, uh, there's an increase in the life expectancy of the working poor. So that would be another negative from a conservative perspective. <laughs> so ridiculous. So good. Napoleon the legend, genius. DJ Danarchy, genius. Uh so many, uh, Crystal Paco, Moondog, we've got so much talent, thanks to all of you. But Ben, uh, I know we took it out of the sound sheet, but may- and maybe we'll spend a minute on it. I- look, I don't really want to talk about Gavin McGinnis because I feel like in 2014, I wasn't interviewing Cornell West. We were in a very different world. And Gavin McGinnis, like, the world is bad enough without dredging up some irrelevant schmuck. However, you did fun. have an encounter with him, if you would like to talk about it for a minute. Yeah, well, like, <laughs> like I said, I mean, I, I did think it was pretty funny. Um, so Gavin McGinnis uh, did this like voice channel AMA thing uh, on a big political discord and the people who were organizing it thought that it might be fun if, if I, you know, was, was at the uh, front of the line so I could, I could ask him a, a question. Um, and it, I, I did think it was pretty funny. Uh, so he, uh, you know, there were a lot of previous questers who were going straight for the, like, you're, you know, a racist piece of shit. And, you know, he, he would just sort of use various rhetorical strategies to brush them off. I was actually really surprised by how bad he is at it. Uh, I would think given how much media he's done um, and, you know, the fact that he was a Fox News contributor for years, found advice, I would think that he'd be a little quicker on his feet with this kind of thing, but uh, apparently not. Um, I don't, my only fear, like, the only thing about Gavin McGinnis that is in any way interesting is that he has, I mean, I've told this a million, I've, or not a million times, but I know I've told the story when I finally did a little bit of like, oh, let me kind of see what's going on with this guy. And I listened to the Buju Banton episode of his podcast where he <laughs> told the story of a great reggae star, Buju Banton, who was essentially a tr- entrapped in a kind of bogus drug case. And he you know and look the guy knows how i'll give him he knows how to tell a yarn he knows how to tell a story he knows how to you know do sort of like self-aware stupid accents which is a i could certainly attest as a skill but he uh and then he looped he basically sort of looped this kind of like defense of buju and and like genuine appreciation of buju's you know some of buju's music's really great 
uh, with the sort of like, basically like you see like all this stuff about like the proud boys or whatever, it's bullshit. There's no there, there. And it was clever. And I, I think he's, I think especially in the world that is on one hand, it's all about, you know, it's like the Angela Nagel thing. It's all about playing with transgression. It's all about triggering certain types of sensibilities. I mean, he's pretty perfectly slotted for that. But on the other hand, I mean, you know, yeah, he's not like, I don't know. He's just kind of like a super upset, freaked out, kind of like, hipster yuppie asshole who doesn't have anything to say i mean so it didn't surprise me i guess my yeah yeah i mean (laughs) i mean i don't know i mean like you compare him to somebody like um you know steve bannon who who i think we both think of as in some ways like a pretty boy republican who has like a superficial lord of darkness shtick but like but he's um, read he's read some books he's yeah i mean that well but bannon is look bannon is a guy that you gotta, I mean, I think that's actually another funny thing about McGinnis is that he's always mentioning like Pop Buchanan. I mean, it's this sort of, I mean, Bannon actually was the one with at least a, enough sense to recognize that you, if you're gonna do right wing populism with ethno nationalistic undertones or kind of play footsie you better at least pretend that you want to like bring home the bacon to working people a little bit. And then Gavin doesn't do that because he still insists on all that libertarian shit. Yeah. Which is again, why he's kind of a fossil while we probably won't even cut this clip up. Yeah. Well, that, so anyway, I, yeah. so I took the opportunity to, to ask him given his supposed libertarianism. I mean, I, kind of think he's a libertarian like general franco is a libertarian but whatever uh, well like it as in a libertarian <laughs> i mean yeah right uh, exactly yeah. not uncommon but whatever yeah uh, so like you know how he thinks the free market would be able to handle the uh, pandemic all on its own and um he uh, and like again, he's just very bad at it. Like he was sort of doing this like rambling thing where he started off saying that everybody would just self quarantine without any government action, but then he kind of had to wander into this series of like dog whistles about people breaking quarantine on the south side of Chicago, and, um, right. and you know, and I kind of called him on that. You know, I was being very polite at this point, but like eventually got to the point where he. Um, he was saying that uh, he was like really biting the bullet. He was saying that if there was no government action whatsoever, no um, no free testing, no stay at home orders, nothing, that exactly as many people would die. There wouldn't be even one extra death. And at that point, because I'm only human, I started laughing, and um, and he called me a glib, something I probably shouldn't repeat while we're on YouTube. Uh, right. <laughs> Uh, and then and then he cut cut off the mic. So you know, like I said, I, I think it's a you know. I mean, on the one hand, of course, uh, his star has fallen a lot, which is you know good. And uh, but like on the other hand, it's like you know, it's 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 relative. I mean, like even the most um, relatively disgraced of these right wing grifters, you know, they never they never completely go away. Right, you know, like he's he's still got true. He's still got much more of an audience than we would like to believe. You know, even true. He's off Fox and everything. So you know, I think it's a a useful exercise and a funny one because he turned out to be so hypersensitive about the whole thing. Yeah, it's, I was actually noticing that because I I spent a few minutes listening to it and I and I actually you know obviously I've got. I don't actually, Matt and I came up with the perfect way of talking to Gavin McGinnis, which is literally just being like, well, I mean, dude, obviously you can launch these projects. You got like a billion dollars when Vice got sold, right? You just, 
you, you just keep you confuse him with Shane Shane Smith or whatever that guy's name is. You just keep saying like, oh yeah, you have like a billion dollars, right? From Vice. Yeah, yeah, you got like a billion. Like Vice got bought was acquired by Viacom, right? You must be like it takes stupid rich. It takes a lot to be a billionaire from a media company guy. Yeah, good job. Exactly. Like, how do you become a zine guy to being a billion? By the way, a zine that was funded with seed money literally by the Canadian government. Like I, I actually just, that I love. And I was reminded of this because I listened to part of the vice episode on, the, on one of the recent episodes of grub stakers, which is a really good podcast. And they pointed out in passing that like the original seed funding for vice came from some type of like, government like canadian grant money to like support i don't even know like the arts or small businesses like they ba- basically precisely like a, a case study in conservative bullshit about where government money goes right like you know you can't you want government like the next thing you know you'll be giving money to a couple of like rich hipster assholes to move to another country and do like fucking style guides in Williamsburg. That's what you want big government for. Like, I just love that it all, it, it tracks to that too, that they, they literally, but anyways, yes. So I thought most of the people though, honestly, I thought they came in way too hard. And I think like immediately going and telling him that he's a bad guy is definitely not the best kind of tactic. And at the same time, it was really funny to listen to that because you would think from the image that he cultivates for himself that he'd be a lot more like he'd joke or he'd have something, but it really actually was just like, okay, like, dude, you're really fucking touchy, bro. Yeah, exactly. Like, you know, you would would think that he would have some skills and kind of deflecting this stuff, joking about it, whatever. And instead, it kind of seemed like he was mostly just getting mad about it or like he was like telling like the kind of jokes that like somebody who is like a a college Republican who's really flustered might tell in the same situation, you know, like like to the extent that there even was an element of jokiness about his response. It was it was this really like brutal, defensive kind of jokiness. Um, totally, to- and it's also like what, where, did, you know. Again, I don't think we should make a fetish of specific words. I'm totally, absolutely of the school of of you know generally sort of having an ethos of respect, which I actually think is echoed like in the conversation with Dr. West. But I also don't think we should give like I think we should make them trying to be transgressive harder than them just saying a word and us freaking out. Sure. So again, I want to put that on the table, but at the same time, like it was just, it was just like, so, so even let's say, cause he kept saying that everybody was like a 20 year old idiot who had no life experience. Okay. So some 20 year old idiot says, Hey Gavin, you're, you know, you're a big meanie jerk racist. And you just go from like zero to a hundred and start calling them like, you know, a, a selected group of slurs and it, and it was, and it was funny. Cause I didn't, I didn't feel triggered. I, I felt kind of like, is this guy drunk? Has he been in therapy? Is he really, 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 really upset that he bailed on vice and did not make money like Shane Smith? Is he embarrassed that some people might think that he made money like Shane Smith? Cause it just seems sad. Yeah, totally. Well, you'll notice too on the age thing. Yeah, this was his big, one of his big strategies. He would like ask people how old they were, and and then it's um you know twenty five or whatever. Like ah, oh, you don't know anything, whatever. So I, I did, you know, since I, I've got, I should at least get something out of being this old. So uh, so I got uh, when I was in the middle of talking to him, you know, like I, at one point I just asked, "You're not going to ask me how old I am." <laughs> 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 I'm 40. I should be able to, you know, use that. But, uh, but yeah, no. I mean, I, I didn't want to like, I didn't want to give him an excuse to shut it down earlier. Right. No, that was smart. I wasn't particularly going to call attention to his 
increasingly ridiculous racist dog whistles. I mean, I figured, you know, I mean, anybody who's listening to that could pick that up, right? You know, they did, you know, nobody needed me to do audio commentary on that. You know, just figured like, let him talk, like, yep. take seriously the I'm a libertarian thing, let him talk about it until he completely embarrasses himself. And then like, show that when somebody actually is trying to like, treat him as if he had something to say and ask you to follow up questions that he just completely can't handle. You just watched a Michael Brooks show video. Subscribe to get them all. Why wouldn't you? Don't be foolish. Click subscribe below and become a patron as well. Patreon.com slash TMBS. Thanks, everybody.